Good morning, friends. In Ephesians 5, Paul gives us a blueprint for walking in love and light. He calls us to be imitators of God, living out His love in our daily interactions. It's like being handed a divine guidebook for a radiant life. Today, we'll explore practical ways to shine brightly in our relationships and communities. Well, Bethany, I'm glad that you're here this morning. Welcome. Uh, I just want to give a big shout out to those that are joining us at Vincennes and Princeton, watching us here in the cafe, and also those that are joining us online. Alyssa, we want you to know that we just prayed for your dad as you're there by his bedside today, and uh, we just want to be able to let you know that this community of believers is praying for you as well. Hey, so what we've been doing has been looking at the book of Ephesians. And so if you want to turn to the Ephesians in your Bible as we get there, I want to celebrate with you what we just got out of this weekend on Friday and Saturday, our men's conference that we titled Uncommon. And uh, Uncommon was this moment where we just, as men, said, listen, there's some things in our life that we haven't done well. And so we need to rebuild. And so we looked at the story of Nehemiah and how Nehemiah rebuilt those walls in 52 days. And we said, he didn't do it by his power and he didn't do it by his intellect. And so men, listen, there's some things in our life that we've destroyed or ruined and some walls in our life that we got to rebuild. It's our marriage or maybe in our parenting or maybe at our workplace or who we are as friends. And uh, you've tried to do it on your own. You can't rebuild those walls. The labor's too intense and it'll take, take too much time. So how about we just get like Nehemiah and we just join in and we say, God, do a good work in me. God, do something good in me. And I'll I'll do my lifting, you do your lifting, and uh, together we'll rebuild the walls in our life that have crumbled down and we'll get this thing back in order, this thing that we call life in all aspects of it. And it was a powerful moment of worship, a powerful moment of fellowship. Some amazing things took place. Paintball happened and uh, a lot of food was eaten for sure. And uh, it was great. And so when it comes back around next year, we had about 200 men that all joined us. Why don't we get 400 in the room and have a great time of celebration and uh, be men who are uncommon in this world. As we look into Ephesians chapter 5 and 6, it starts off by really telling us that we're to be imitators of Christ Jesus. Now that sounds big, it sounds lofty, but I bet you there's some things in life where you're a little off course on that. There's a, a navigational rule that's called the 60 and 1 rule or 60 and 1 principle. That means for every 60 miles you fly, if you're one degree off, uh, you'll, you'll be one mile off your t- intended target or off your intended des- destination. No big deal if it's 60 feet. 60 miles, you're a mile away. You might be able to find your destination. But what, al- what happened if you just took off from JFK and you were just a, a degree off from where you wanted to head your destination at San Francisco? Well, you'd be about 45 miles off. You wouldn't be able to be even close to the bay. You would be totally out of range of the entire airport. And some of you are like, well, that's no big deal. I don't want to go to San Francisco anyway, right? To miss that place, no big deal. But what I'm getting at is the little thing, the little minute correction off, it could just get you in a place where you're so far away from your intended target. Now, think about that in your relationships for a second, in your marriage, in in your parenting, in your workplace. What I've discovered in my own life is it's not like the nuclear bombs that drop in the marriage are the things that get us off course. It's like the little things. It's my selfishness. It's my, my, my ego, my demand to have my way. It's my inability to say sorry. It's all those kinds of things that get in the way. It's not the, it's not the big things that get my life off course. It's usually the little things. And same is true in all my relationships with my kids and here at, at church with people in the workplace. And I bet you say it's true with you as well. It's not the big things. It's the little things that you just, you know, you, you just don't allow yourself to be corrected day in and day out. Well, Ephesians chapter 5 and 6, big chunk of scripture it's page 949, 950 in the Bible in the chair rack in front of you. Paul lays out kind of the perfect GPS coordinates on how to get your relationships back. And so we've already talked about how to get our relationship back when it comes to the division that could be in the church because of our background. And so Paul's already laid that out. And now he's given us new principles to be practical with on how to get our relationships in order. And to understand it, you've got to really know where Paul's going with this. And it's found in chapter 4. Of verse 1. So before we get into 5, let's go to 4. Let's look at verse 1. It's on the screen here as well. He just simply says, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. And that's not the same calling that we talked about a couple weeks ago. As we talked about the particular calling that God has in your life to do something amazing and big and audacious for him. This is a calling that every believer is called to, and that is to be imitators of Christ Jesus. And here's how he begins. He begins in Ephesians chapter 5, sections 1 through 7, and I've just titled this, You Are Called to Love Like Christ, Love Sacrificially. And Paul starts out by saying, we're to be imitators of God. We're to be imitators of Christ Jesus' love that he has shown to us. We're to imitate that in our world. 
Have you ever seen a toddler growing up and kind of like a little, you know, mini Matt or mini, you know, dad in a, in a sense, like just trying to be the best version of their dad they can be, holding their sippy cup like their dad holds their coffee cup, you know, putting on the sunglasses like their dad, just mimicking the best way they can. Paul says, would you do the best that you can in imitating who Christ Jesus is because you are God's kid? And here's his encouragement in verses one and two. Follow God's example. Some of you have in the scriptures, it just simply says, be imitators of, of God. Therefore, as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Can I tell you how God's love is different than the world's definition of love? God's love simply says, I'm going to give you my best even if it costs me everything. I'm going to give you my very best even if it costs you, costs me rather, everything. You know what the world says? The world says, I'll take whatever benefits me no matter what it costs you. I'll take whatever benefits me at whatever it costs you. Two completely different ways of living. One's rooted in giving, one's rooted in taking. One's rooted in sacrifice, the other one is rooted in selfishness. And I love what Paul says, he's like, you need to be imitators of God and you need to be loving sacrificially. And can I tell you what? People who love sacrificially, they don't get involved in, look at verses three through seven. They don't get involved in this junk. They don't get involved in sexual immorality. You want to know why? People who sacrifice and are sacrificial in love don't get involved in sexual immorality because those are the things that burn bridges in relationships, especially the most intimate of relationships, the, the, the relationship of marriage. They don't get involved in impurity. They don't get involved in things that produce sin. Listen, they don't get involved in things that are greedy. Why? Because that's selfishness, not sacrificial love. They don't, they don't have dirty jokes that run down people. They don't have silly chatter that's gossip. They don't get rude with their humor and rude with people. Why? Because that's not sacrificial love. That's selfish behavior. That's just totally out of place when it comes to behaving like Christ Jesus. And Paul emphasizes in verse 2, notice this, walk in the way of love. That's to be our walk. This is to be our path. Not the warm, fuzzy feeling kind of love like you all know who've been in a relationship for a long time, especially a marriage relationship, you're like, listen, the hair on the back of my neck's not standing up anymore. I'm not getting goosebumps any longer when you walk in the room. I had to make a decision a long time ago, this is at least what my wife tells me. She had to make a decision a long time ago to love me because there's a lot of things in me that are hard to love. And she's like, I'm going to love you even if you wake up this way, grumpy. I'm going to love you even if. I'm going to love you. Even if you're annoying or inconvenient or uncomfortable for me, I'm going to love you. I'm going to love you at all costs. Friends, the world doesn't understand that kind of love. And when you show a sacrificial love and you walk in the way of love and you start imitating God and you start showing people love like the sacrificial love that Paul calls us to, the world takes notice of it. I have a friend in Ohio. He's in ministry. He was telling me about a school teacher that attends his congregation. The school teacher's name is Eddie. Eddie had found out that one of the students in his class that he doesn't know very well was looking very, you know, uh, worn out and then awfully sick from time to time. And then finally he just came to Eddie and said, hey, you got to be at school more often unless there's a problem. And, and, and the, the, the student finally told the teacher, listen, here's what's going on in my life. I have kidney failure. I, I need a kidney donor. I'm on the list, but I'm way down on the list. And there's no one that really seems to be a match. Now, his teacher, Eddie, Christian, decided, you know what, I probably should write him a note, a nice note, Hey, my thoughts are with you, my prayers are with you, and you need to know from this day forward, I'm praying for it. But instead of just doing that, he decided, I'm going to figure out what it is that exactly is needed to be a match, to be a kidney donor for this student of mine. So he goes to the doctor, runs the processes and the tests, finds out he's an exact match. And he had this moment where he was like, do I, do I make this known? Because if I'm an exact match and my student needs a kidney and I happen to have just one of those... Uh, should I let that out of the bag? And he decides, you know what? What would Christ do? Christ would give. And Christ would be sacrificial, even to the point of death or costing his own life. And so Eddie decided, this is a teacher who barely knows this student. I'm going to give up my kidney to this student so that he can have a second chance of life. Not only did he give up his kidney, he gave up his time. He went through a very complicated surgery, spent weeks in recovery for someone whom he barely knew so that they could have a chance at a second life. You know, you, you watch the news stories, 
You would have caught that. You would have heard that story. It made national news because stuff like that doesn't happen very often. The sacrificial love of giving of something and saying, this is, this is going to cost me dearly and you're going to gain extremely from what I'm about to do for you. And we're called to walk in that way of love. Walk in a way that takes us far beyond convenience. And maybe, maybe it's helping out with a friend. Maybe it's giving the attention with your listening ear and just saying, listen, I, I know right now this is going to cost me a lot of emotional things, but I'm going to give myself over to, to listening. This is going to cause me some time. I'm going to give this over. I'm going to sacrifice in this way. could be even bigger than that. could be bigger in your marriage or as it relates to your kids or as it relates to your job. Paul's about ready to show us that. But in verses 3 and 5, Paul's clear. Like, let's give up this selfish behavior because that gets us into trouble. And let's turn and look to Jesus on how to really show love. How did Jesus show love? Well, he's sacrificial, wasn't he? All the way to the point of death. And if you look at Jesus, he just literally gave everything he had for us. Gave up his comfort, gave up his status, and ultimately he gave up his life on the cross so that you and I could have a, a relationship with God in a perfect way without the hindrance of our sins. He took on our sins. And friends, we need to remember, as we think through Jesus, that he was always giving. He was always loving. It's not like he had a moment where he said, okay, I'm turning love off for a moment. It's about me now. I'm turning this off. I need some me time. I need some Jesus time. When he had Jesus time, he just would retreat from the crowd and he would humble himself and pray and say, God, fill me so I can keep loving others in a way that just, just seems incredible through the lens of the world. And he helped people. He fed people. He healed people. He put up with people that were trying to kill him. And he was so gracious to the Pharisees that thought they were so much more religious and righteous than he was. His entire life was an act of putting others first. And he constantly sacrificed. It cost him. Because that's what sacrificial love does. To imitate Christ, like Paul says, means that we will give up something so someone can be loved. I will give my best even if it costs me everything. How do you apply this? Let me challenge you with this. This week, why don't you pick someone in your world? Pick someone at your office. Pick someone that annoys you. Pick someone that always asks more of you than you want to give. Pick something in your life. Maybe you need to forgive somebody and you've held on to it for too long. You sacrifice that in the name of sacrificial love and you forgive someone and you get them off of that burden. It could be a kind word, but probably going to be an act of kindness in some way. What can cost you so that someone will know that the love of Christ is in you? Okay, Paul moves on. In this next section, Ephesians chapter 5, 8 through 14, he just simply says, let's walk in the light now. Let's walk in love, but let's walk in light. So I've titled this, you're called from darkness to light. That's what our call is. I put this as live boldly. We're called to step out of the darkness, live in the light. Light's bold, especially in dark places, right? A beam of light is attractive and it is bold, especially when it's inky dark outside. And Paul, he emphasizes some more sins. And he says, listen, there's things like greed and dirty talk and some sketchy stuff in your life that you've walked away from. But that's still happening in the darkness of the world. And so though you've walked away from it, you're to be a light in the darkness that is still holding on to all that sketchy stuff. Look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8. For you were once, for you were once darkness. You were once that way. But now... You are the light in the Lord. Live as children of the light. You can almost think that Paul's referring back to the teachings of Jesus, especially in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says, a city on a hill can't be hidden. Shine your light for all to see so that God will be glorified in heaven. And it's almost like Paul's referring us back to that, that you're children of God and God is light in the darkened spaces. So you need to be living boldly the behaviors of who Christ is and imitating God in all of your life. Even in those areas that you think, no one's going to notice. No one's going to know. Like I can close my door, I can draw my shades here, and no one's going to know how I'm living. No one's going to know what I'm watching. It doesn't really matter. Paul's like, no, no. In all the areas where it's dark, shine the light of Christ and be bold. Verses 9 and 11, he tells us what the light looks like when it's in dark places. Check this out. It's righteous. It's truth. It's good. Hey, when you walk into a space in darkness, you walk into your home or you walk into your workplace or you walk into a, a, an environment that just seems to be overwhelmed with just the darkness of greed or the darkness of sketchy stuff and the darkness of dirty talk and the darkness of 
The Bible calls it debauchery. I don't even, even know exactly what that means, but I don't like the word. Just caught up in things that are not honoring God, and you walk in. That darkness should say, goodness just walked in. Truth just walked in. Righteousness just walked in. And friends, not a righteousness that puts their nose up, but a righteousness that says, I've come to lead you to the Lord. I'm a beggar telling other beggars where to find some bread today. It should chase evil away, Paul says. That's what it also does. It should chase disobedience away. It should chase lies away. That's what the light does in the darkness. Verse 14 has a strange stanza. You can see it in your scriptures. Looks like kind of written in poetic form in a sense. I don't know where Paul got this little quote, but it's obviously a quote. It's, it's not some reference of scripture from somewhere else. It more than likely was a stanza from some hymn that they sang in the early church. And it was like a song that he pulled a lyric out of. And he says, you guys know the lyric from that song we sing, wake up sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. He's like, yeah, that's how we need to be. You gotta wake up, church, wake up. And I know for a fact that Paul, when he says sleeper and dead, he's saying, you were once a sinner. You once lived in darkness. What I know about darkness is you stumble around in darkness. That's what I know about darkness. Like you can't see things real well in darkness. Everybody's gone through the steps of trying to turn their flashlight on on their phone, right? And you use your, your flashlight on your phone all the time because you don't want to stumble around in the darkness. And I just thought about the other night when I was... Uh, Oh, come on. At my age, I wake up in the middle of the night for other things. So I was getting up in the middle of the night, and it's completely dark. I mean, pitch black dark in our room. And instead of turning on the light, like someone smart, I just decided to kind of like, you know, read the room by Braille about what I was kind of bumping into, you know? Oh, that must be the dresser. Okay, that, okay that's, that's the chair. Okay, I know where I'm at now. But listen, I, nothing, I could handle all that until I, I nearly lost my religion, when I stepped right on the Lego block. <laughs> Any dad in the room ever stepped on the Lego block? Like that is a miserable feeling. There were some things that came out of my mouth, okay, that I'm not gonna tell you all about. I just want you to know there's gonna be some Legos hanging with Satan for all of eternity in hell, just so you know that. And at my age, I don't need to be doing the old like, let's, let's walk by Braille in the middle of the night. Kind of, I'm, gonna, I'm turning on the light from here on out. I don't need the late night obstacle course just to go to the bathroom anymore. But what I know is this, you'll stumble in the darkness when there's no light. And when we stumble in the darkness when there is no light, it usually hurts us. And so friends, what Paul's calling us to be are lights in the darkness, but not just that, children of light. Did you catch that in verse eight? We're to be children of light, that's to be our title. That we're imitators and that we're, we're connected to God who is the father of the light. We're children of the light. Now can I get a little bit more personal? Because we're talking about shining light into spaces that are dark. And I know we're thinking other people are dark and we're the light. But if there's a bit of what Paul's talking about to say, what darkness resides in you still? Because you're walking out of the dark, there's gotta be something that you've held back from God allowing to illuminate to say, I'm gonna expose this in you. And when it's exposed, what do you do? Try to keep it in the dark? Or do you say, God, I'll allow you to take this from me, this stronghold, this behavior, this thought, whatever it is, and I'll let you shine your truth in it, your goodness and your righteousness. I don't want to be disobedient any longer. I don't want to chase evil. I don't want lies to be my livelihood. And you're just telling God, work in me. So what's the challenge of this? I think the challenge could simply be, what's the area in your life right now as a believer that you feel like you haven't really fully handed over to God? What's the area where you go, I, I, I'm a God's kid, but I don't always live up to the attributes of God. I don't always behave that way. I don't always act that way. Especially when, when the door is shut and the blinds are drawn, I don't always seem to be imitating God and living boldly in the, all the areas of my, God, would you shine some light into the dark spaces that I still have, but I wanna hand over to you. Here's the third part. Ephesians 5, verse 15 through 21, Paul urges us to live wisely. He's, he's instructed us to love sacrificially. He's, he's instructed us to live boldly. Now he's asking us to live wisely. You're called to be filled with the Spirit. Listen to what Paul says about living wisely and what that means about Christ in you. Ephesians 5, verse 15 through 16. Be careful. Be very careful then. 
and how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. It's almost like a dad saying, wise up, you know, wise up here. You haven't made a lot of good decisions, and you really don't have anything to blame. You can't blame your age. It's not your youth. It's, it's not because you didn't have the right role models. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. Make the most of every opportunity. I love that line. It's like, it doesn't matter where you're at. You need to recognize that people in the dark world are watching people of the light, and they're saying, how do you love sacrificially? How do you live boldly? How do you live wisely? I'm watching your decisions Paul says, you you make the most of every opportunity, whether you're at home or in your marriage or in the workplace, because the days are evil. Look at verse 17. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. If you get into verse 18, Paul gives us a little tip on how to act wise. You want to know what it is? Skip the drunken parties. So just don't be filled with corona. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Isn't it interesting that in our English language, we've called liquor and alcohol spirits. And they take control over us. Some of you are like, man, I did some things last night that I didn't mean to do. Guess what? I bet you wouldn't have done them if you weren't under the influence of some spirits. And Paul says, can I tell you that there are a lot of people in this world that allow the spirits to influence them? And they try to get joyful with some spirits. They try to get happy through some pills. Paul's like, can I just encourage you for a moment? Instead of filling yourself up with what the world says is the way to happiness, or the world says is the way to peace, or the world says is whatever way that can get you satisfied, how about you just start filling yourself up with the Holy Spirit of God? You know, church, I recognize, even in godly people, that there are times when we we just run on empty in our faith. Run on, some of you right now, you're in here today because you're running on empty in your faith and you're like, I don't know what God has for me. I don't know what God's saying to me. I'm not sure how to live. I haven't been living wisely, uh, not just lately. I just haven't been living wisely for a few years now. Can I just suggest to you, maybe you're not allowing God to fill you with his spirit. You're, you're filling yourself with other things, but not his spirit. A few weeks ago, we were all kind of connecting as a staff. Some men were just connecting as a staff in a parking lot, kind of you know, park our cars and then commute to one of our other campuses. And while we were kind of all pulling in, almost at the same time, a guy's flying down the hill, clearly out of control in his car, and his car just careens into the metal uh, guardrail and just kind of wrecks the side of his car. And now we immediately thought he had popped a tire, something lost control. We didn't know what was going on. So to get him out of the road, we push him back. We try to be the best, you know, good Samaritans we could. We pushed him back. But then we kind of just like asked some questions like, what, what happened, right? Like, how did you just careen into a guardrail on a straight path of the road? And we're like, was it your flat tire? And he's like, oh, no, 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 it wasn't a flat tire. He's like, I ran out of gas. Like, you ran out of gas? He's like, yeah, I ran out of gas. And I think what happened was I lost control because the power steering stopped and it just kind of swung me into the guardrail. We're like, you, but you got a low tire. He goes, yeah, I was going to the gas station to fill up my flat tire and to go get gas at the same time. Only a guy like that can take two problems and make a third problem crash his car. And I'm like, that's pretty impressive, you know, that's pretty neat. But I thought, that's my life, man. That's my life. Two problems become three problems real quick. All because I I can't handle one, the major problem. Now, I know what he's trying to do, right? He's trying to get through his day, just if I could just get to the gas station and get this tire pumped up, my car will drive better. Oh, wait, for my car to drive, I need some gas. I, I, I know how your life works, okay? It, it looks like mine. There's not a lot of margin there. You complain about a lot of stuff, the same things I complain about. I gotta get my kids here. I gotta do this here. My, my, my job's demanding this of me. Oh, I gotta keep this person happy in this relationship. I gotta do these kinds of things in the marriage just because it's a part of who I am and loving my spouse. And I, oh, and I gotta do these community things as well. And your, your life just heaps up with all this stuff. And a lot of us think, if I could just get simpler in life, I could finally just breathe a little bit, have a little bit more energy. No. Paul's suggestion is, no, 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 no. You are empty in the Holy Spirit. You're you're trying to live under your own fuel. You're trying to produce your own happiness. You're trying to produce your own joy. Paul's like, that's not the way this works here. Imitate Christ, imitate God who is filled with his spirit. You be filled. Some of you are running out of gas, but you're blaming the low tire for the wreck that you're in. We're just like, I know, 
I will get connected with God's Holy Spirit. You know what I found out in this series? There's a lot of Christians that have no clue about God's Holy Spirit. In, in the next four weeks, we finish out Ephesians next week. In the following weeks, four weeks, we just look at God's Holy Spirit. The power, his purpose, his presence in our life, and how that affects us as believers. I think it's an important series. But if you don't know the Holy Spirit work in your life, and you're a believer, you got to get connected with Discover Bethany. We have some great things in place here to help you understand what God wants to do in you and through you. Some of you are like, I, the, I, I don't even know where to begin. You're talking about getting filled with the Holy Spirit. Friends, if, if all you're doing is coming to the gas station, so to speak, on Sundays, you have missed out, because I bet you're running empty by, I don't know, Tuesday, Monday. You gotta get in a small group. You gotta get in fellowship with other believers to fill you, to, to, to hold you accountable, to love on you. Maybe you're like, where does this even begin? Here's where it begins. How many of you just start the morning by saying, God, today, I need you because I want to make some wise decisions because my default mode is I make stupid decisions. I tried to drive my life on a flat tire nearly running out of gas, and I hit the guardrail last week, and I think I'll probably hit the guardrail this week. So God, would you teach me? God, would you show me? God, would you work within me? Would you give me wisdom and discernment as I take on the challenges of my week, as I face my coworkers, as I parent, in my marriage, in my relationships, how I handle my schedule? Lord, would you fill me today? Here's the challenge. The challenge is simple. Number one, like Paul, Quit running on empty and doing stupid stuff. You're like, easier said than done. Okay, welcome God's spirit into your life. Get back into his word again. Get back to praying first thing in the morning. God, fill me up. And watch how your, God transforms your attitude towards your coworkers. Watch God how he transforms your relationships with your spouse. Gives you more patience with your kids. Because that's what the Holy Spirit does. You produce fruits within you that you can't produce for yourself. So when is the last time, honestly, church, when is the last time that you said, Lord, I just welcome you today into my life? I don't know how to make a good decision. So I welcome you to make some good decisions for me. Prod me in that way. Hey, what Paul does is he uses those three things, those three points that we just talked about. Loving sacrificially, living boldly, and, and being filled with the Holy Spirit. And then he basically says, hey, believers, you'll have changed behavior. If you're a believer in Jesus, you're going to have some changed behavior. It's going to affect your marriage. It's going to affect your parenting. It's going to affect your work. It's going to affect all that stuff. You'll have changed behavior. And I know some of you are like, this is about behavior modification. Got it. So the next time I do something stupid, I'll just smack my hand. Or the next time I do something stupid, I'll tell myself some names and I'll run myself down. I think that's the game of a lot of people. The Bible never talks about behavior modification. Not once. It doesn't say, like, get better. Do better. Be gooder. It doesn't say any of that. As a matter of fact, the Bible talks about heart transformation. Not behavioral modification. You, you want to do better? You want to be more like Christ? You want to be an imitator of Christ? You want to be a person that can love sacrificially, live boldly, and walk wisely? Change your heart. Now, Proverbs just reminds me to guard my heart above all else. For it determines the, now catch this word, the course for my life. Some of us are a little off course right now. And we know it. We know we're a little off course. We haven't been imitating Christ like we can or could. And we know we're off course. The Bible says, you want to get back on course? You start working on your heart, not behavioral modification. Allow God to do a good work here. You know, start doing a good work out here. So how does that work? Because Paul says, it will be seen in your life. This stuff will be seen in your life. And this is why he points out to us this section on marriage. This is why he points out to us the next section about parenting in chapter 6. And then the next section about how to be a good employee or employer in chapter 6 at the beginning. He holds us up like a mirror to say, how you doing? How you doing? 
How are you doing with this love sacrificially stuff? Because if you want to know how you're doing, just look at your marriage. And Paul looks at the most intimate relationships that we most likely have. And he starts with marriage. And I know a lot of times we take it kind of out of context. We say, here's some good marital advice and foundations for us. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 and following. Men be this way, women be this way. I know how we do it. But in context here, towards the Ephesians, Paul's saying, you want to know if you're really imitating Christ? How well do you love your wife, men? Because Paul says in verse 25, husbands, love your wives as Christ loves the church, and he gave himself up for her. He was sacrificial. So men, you want to know how well you're doing with this imitating Christ stuff? Are you sacrificial in one of the most sacred relationships on earth, your marriage towards your wife? And I love how he starts off. He starts off that section of marriage. He says, do you need me to make a little bit of a course correction, wives? Because verse 22, he says, wives, you need to submit to you yourselves to your own husband as you do the Lord. I know, okay, negative words, submit. I understand it. I get it. English, poor translation, clearly a poor translation, because ultimately there's a lot of baggage with the English word submit. A lot of churches and a lot of men have taken that word submit and they've lorded it over women, haven't created an equal partner, haven't created a helpmate, just, just, just found their stance of being dominant over their, their, their spouse, their wife. Totally wrong. Because what that word means actually is to be totally committed. Paul starts off by saying this. Wives, are you totally committed to your husband? Or are you always on the fence? Are you totally committed? Or do you just love him when he shows you love first? Are you totally committed to this relationship? Are you totally committed to him? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 through 7. We just looked at that, that section of scripture. We are called, we are called to love like Christ. Love sacrificially. Are you doing that? Well, well, I don't know, God. Look at the most intimate relationship you have. Are you loving your wife like Christ loves the church? And wives, are you totally committed to him and showing him the respect that he deserves? Okay, I know he's a fool. I know he stumbles. I know he's not perfect, but he's trying to love you. He's trying to be the best Jesus he can to you. Are you respecting him for that? Here, listen. Here's how you can put this to work in your marriage relationship. Your goal is to be intentional with your spouse. Husbands, you need to ask this question. How can I be better at sacrificing for my wife? Remember sacrifices? I'm going to give up something so that they can gain something. Wives, how can you show greater respect to your husband who's doing what he can in all the ways he can, to love you like Jesus the best he can. Then he moves on into this section about parenting. He raises this elevated level to the perfect picture of what it looks like to be a parent. Honor your father and mother. Some of you know, as kids, you're like, how it's, how it's hard to honor a father and mother when they haven't really been good mothers and good fathers. And Paul says, listen, the scriptures tell us that when you do that, it goes well for you. Oh, and a little advice for parents. He says, hey, dads, because in that time, that was the number one disciplinarian in the home, you don't exasperate your children. You don't whip the spirit out of them, but you need to encourage them and raise them up and build them up to higher heights, even if it is in relationship to discipline. I got a seven-year-old. So many of you guys know my seven-year-old, Jackson. Man, he, he can be hard at times. He, he's, he's usually the best. I love him to death. But he can be difficult at times. And what I get from this was, I'm going to love him in a way that's gracious, even when he needs to be disciplined. I'm going to love him in a way where I don't lose my cool, so I can be an imitator of Christ Jesus. Friends, where this comes down to is, how well are you living boldly the light of Christ in your home? And Paul shines this bit onto us and says, you want to know if you're really living boldly? Are you living Jesus out? behind closed doors? Are you living Jesus out when the curtains are drawn? Are you really living out Jesus? Because people are watching. Then he moves into this last part. A lot of part about workers. Now I know in the scriptures it says slaves and masters. Don't get caught up in that. 
Because that's not ultimately what it's being talked about. It's not talking about slaves in a modern sense as we would understand slavery in the American context. That's not it at all. This is not like working but being forced to work and chained when you're not working. This is actually saying you're an employee. You're clocking in, and when you're clocked in, your mind is focused on the work at hand that's before you. That's actually what it means to be a slave in this, in this particular context. And to be a master means that you have charge, you have authority over them, that you're a, a boss in all the, the terms, both positive and negative. Look what it says in verse 7 of chapter 6 about this. Serve, then. This is talking to the slaves, the people that have to clock in, clock out, the people that have to say, okay, right now my mind is focused on my work. Serve wholeheartedly as you were serving the Lord, not people. Can you imagine showing up to Toyota tomorrow and clocking in with a smile on your face and being like, I'm here today to serve. And they're like, this is crazy, what's up? I ain't serving Toyota, clocking in. I'm here to serve the Lord. Can you imagine how your attitude would change? If you walked in and said, I'm here to serve the Lord today. I don't know what that looks like, but I know it means I'm gonna love someone here sacrificially. Hey, Brad, you don't deserve it, but I'm gonna love you today. Hey, guess what? I'm gonna have to live boldly in some dark places. I'm here to serve the Lord. What if you just had this attitude that said, I'm not here putting in time. I'm not here looking for retirement. I'm not here just trying to work for the weekend. I'm here to serve the Lord, and I'm going to do it with purpose. I am going to make the most of every opportunity, and I'm going to be filled with the Spirit, and I'm going to live wisely. What if you just took on Christ and imitated Christ and loved sacrificially and lived boldly and walked wisely. The challenge this week, if you're in your workplace, to approach your work with the mindset that I'm serving Christ Jesus. And I'm getting paid to do it. And my attitude will change to those that are around me. My attitude will shift to what I think about the company or what I think about my boss whether if they treat me well or not. And by the way, just if you're on the other side of this, I love how Paul flips the script and says, oh yeah, if you own some things and you have some people working for you, you best treat them right as well. And you serve them. Hey, whether you're married, whether you're raising kids or dealing with your boss at work, or I don't know, maybe you're like me, you're just trying to survive some text messages from some in-laws from time to time, you know, you're like, I don't know. The truth that Paul gave us transform our lives. Be imitators of Christ. How? Love sacrificially. Live boldly. Walk wisely. And if you want to reflect Christ, love like Christ. If you want to reflect Christ, shine the light of Christ. And if you want to live the light of Christ, you need to walk in the way of Christ in wisdom. Not just change behavior, but a changed and transformed heart, which changes the believer. And Paul says, you want to reflect Christ? You want to love on people? You want to walk wisely? Something change has to happen here, right here. And so how well has that happened in your life? You want to test about where you're at in this? Okay, look at your marriage. How well are you loving your spouse in your marriage? Or do you have an area where you need to course correct? Course correct. Because loving your spouse will just make you better at loving other people too. Okay, parenting. How well are you doing here? Because that's an intimate relationship, a good one to look at. Are you... Are you, are, you, are you really living boldly in all areas of your life, really striving to live like Christ? Your kids know that you're a believer or just do they think that about you on Sundays? And thirdly, like when you go to workplace, when you, go, like you look at that, that dynamic that happens with your boss or that dynamic that happens with your coworkers or that dynamic that happens with your, your, the ones you employ, do they see you as someone who's wise, making the most of every opportunity? Do they see you serving the Lord there? You're just serving yourself. How are you doing on this? What needs to be corrected and what needs to be changed? Because the beauty thing about it is God can transform us. And when we allow him to transform us, this is, this is awesome. So what he's getting at. It transforms our marriage. It transforms our home. And it transforms the, our place of work. So how about we just go, God, would you just... Do a good work in me today. I got some things I need to course correct. I, I know it. Would you just start here and do a good work in me? 
And friends, you'll find he'll not just do a good work in you. He'll do a good work through you too. Let's pray. Lord, I know that this world's so hard to navigate sometimes. We get stuck in the rut of just doing what the world always does. Loving to that bare minimum level that the world says is love, but not sacrificially. We, we just, we kind of identify with the darkness, flirt with it at times. We, we don't let it, we, we, just, we just hold on to it in other moments. And Father, may we just be bold in who we are. We're Christians first. And so Father, also, in the way we handle our relationships with coworkers and some people that are hard to love, May we be wise, filled with your spirit, serving you. And so, Father, we want these things, not just so that we'll be better people, behaved people. No, we want to be transformed people. We want to be witnesses of what you can do in someone's life. And so, Father, may we be great examples of Christ so that others will follow Christ. May we love sacrificially. May we live boldly, and may we walk wisely. In Christ's name we pray.